All right. Hello. Good evening. I think my mic is on. Yes, it is. Good evening, everybody. Uh, how's it going? I am back with another with another opening lesson today, as you can see. So today we will be looking at the Leningrad Dutch. So has anyone heard of the Leningrad Dutch? I hope you haven't because today we will be looking at it and we'll be looking at some different variations uh, for black. So we're going to be looking at black's perspective. And yeah, so the Leningrad, Leningrad Dutch. In the Dutch opening you actually have um, different variations, but we are specifying on the Leningrad Dutch. There's also, for example, the Stonewall, but that's something that another coach as streamer, I think Max, will be covering. Um, I think tomorrow, the day after after tomorrow. So if you wanna, if you wanna learn about that, then uh, make sure to tune in as well. But today we'll be looking at the Leningrad Dutch. And I would say it's not really a difficult opening. It's a rather logical uh, opening. The moving sequence is pretty logical. Um, once you've reached the typical setup, um, you can go several ways. But um, and also the moving sequence does the moving order doesn't really matter in the um, in the Leningrad Dutch um, because for example in the Dutch you go d4 f5 right um, help us on the King's Indian no I, I've actually done the King's Indian um, I think a few streams ago I think it was King's Indian right um, but no we're, we're doing something else today we're doing the Leningrad Dutch so can't can't just uh, switch switch uh, the subject all of a sudden because I've prepared the Leningrad Dutch for you today so if you want to look at some other openings or some previous ones you can always scroll back to other videos um, that have been streamed before so what I was what, what was I saying um, so yeah the moving the move order doesn't really matter because with the Dutch you start off with d4 f5 right but some players could even start off with c4 for example and you still get into that typical position so as long as you get into that position, it doesn't really matter what moving, what move order you use. Um, so yeah, you don't have to follow the typical, or the, the, you don't have to follow a certain move order. But of course you can if you want to, but you don't have to. So yeah, let's, let's get into it. Let's have a look how the Leningrad Dutch goes. All right, so it goes d4, f5. Like I already mentioned, this is the Dutch. Uh, and now white goes c4. And here we can see, um, so black actually um, doesn't go for d5 or e6 or knight f6 or any other move. Black goes for f5, which is also looking at the central squares. It's actually looking at the e4 square in particular. Um, so it's also controlling the center a bit so that white cannot push e4 immediately. Um, but it's also putting some pressure on the center. Not as strong as d5, of, of course. d5 is a typical um, move that really controls the central squares, such as e4 and c4. But f5 just controls the e4 square. Um, and there are some assets, but there are also some like disadvantages about this move. Um, one of the biggest disadvantages can be that you're weakening your king on e8. So as you can see, the f pawn has moved. That means that the g8, um, let's draw an arrow, the g8, a2 diagonal can be weak once black castles. So once the king is on g8, um, you need to be careful about some checks maybe on this diagonal or some tricks. Um, so that can be a little bit scary sometimes, but there are also some um, advantages about this move. And that's mostly that you can go for a king side attack. So with the pawn on f5, you can most of the time um, move your, yeah, you, you, will, you will castle short, that's for sure, just to have your rook behind your pawn. And if white castles short too, you will be able to go for a kingside attack. If white allows you to, of course. So f5. All right. Now white goes c4. Knight f6. Knight f3. G6. G3, white is the same, so you're Fianchettoing, Fianchettoing, your bishop. And now after bishop g7, white goes bishop g2. So you're both doing the same. It's not really hard to memorize it though. Um, so the yeah, it's it's basically the same with the g6, g3, and then you're developing the bishops, and now you castle. You both castle, and then you go d6. So 
up till move, let's say, yeah, up till move seven. This is a typical setup um, with your pawns on f5, g6, your bishop on g7, your knight on f6, and you've castled, and you have a little pawn on d6, which can support uh, e5 or c5. So this is a typical, typical setup you should memorize. Um, and how you get there, which move, move order you play, it's up to you. Depends on your per personal preferences, I guess. So you could, if, if you're white, you can start off with c4 or maybe with knight of three. Doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, here with black, we can go several ways. And I have picked three variations. So the first variation we're, go we're, gonna, be look at, we're gonna be looking at is knight to c6. So let's draw an arrow. Um, so knight to c6. Um, the other variation that we will be looking at is c6. And the last variation we'll be looking at is queen to a8, which is more played nowadays, queen e8. So let's... Oh, I'm so cold. That's why I'm shaking a little bit. <laughs> All right. It's really cold in here. Oof. Okay. Knight to c6. That's where, what we're going to be looking at now. All right. And the idea behind knight c6 is, well, one, you're developing your knight, and two, you're also trying to push e5. So now white goes d5 most of the time, just to kick that knight. And um, now black can actually choose between two possible um, moves. Um, so you can go either knight to e5 or knight to a5. Um, obviously, knight to b8 seems like a very, very passive move, so I would not recommend doing that. You'll, you'll just be losing a tempo, and you'll be just going back to, uh, to the 8th rank where you, where you started off. So you're not going back, you're not going to play passively, you're going to play actively. So either e5 or a5 are good moves. So let's have a look at um, knight to e5. So knight to e5, um, white can take it. And black takes it back. Um, so here you can see that black is actually allowing to double up his own pawns. And usually, if, if you're able, if you're if you're um, common with chess, you don't really like double pawns, right? You don't really like your blo pawns blocking each other. It's just sometimes it can be very uncomfortable and very annoying as well. But one asset about this is that these pawns. Um, can actually be very strong. You have two central pawns now, or not very central, but you have an E pawn and an F pawn um, that are kind of strong um, and they can actually lead to a kingside attack as well. So that is one good thing about this. Um, and yeah, I actually ended the variation here because you could go, you could go a lot of ways here. And I will show you a game how um, two players play this or how you could play it. And um, yeah, then it'll be more clear or you'll, you'll get some inspiration from that game then maybe. So instead of showing all theoretical moves, I think it's more fun to show a game instead uh, and give you some inspiration or some ideas of, of how grandmasters would play it. Am I right? Okay, so that was knight to e5. Um, hello, eccentric horse. Good evening. And now we'll have a look at knight to a5. Okay, knight to a5. Um, here you're not allowing to double up, your, uh, double up your pawns, of course. You're going to the edge of the board, which can be well, kind of scary sometimes because it can be trapped if you're not careful. So so now if you if you don't do anything, um, b4 might come. But of course, white needs to defend needs to defend the c4 pawn first because that's the that's the threat now. That is what black is threatening right now to take that pawn. So that's why white uh, goes queen d3. Queen d3 is uh, protecting this pawn on c4 and is now actually uh, also threatening b4. Uh, and after b4, well, you can already um, see it that the knight doesn't have any squares to, to run off to. So the knight will be trapped and will be captured. So that is not really good. All right. Uh, and we need, to do some, we need to do something about that, right? So we, need to, we do not want to lose our knight. We need to find a move that doesn't lose our knight. 
So what move would you play here um, with black that that doesn't lose your knights? <clears throat> oh, I'm so cold. <laughs> oh, all right. Anyway, what, what what move would you play here, guys? Uh, hello, Dutch Day. Um, yes, the old line with knight c6, indeed. Um, but we're we're also gonna be looking at uh, queen e8, which is more played nowadays. And um, yeah, this is a very good opening. <laughs> Dutch Dutch opening for Dutch Day. <laughs> um, okay, so Calvin says c5. Very good move. That's actually a very good move. Yes. Um, Pietro Bono says b6. Um, I was already afraid that someone would, would say b6 because b6 seems like a logical move because you're you're creating a, a square, um, a running square for your knight, right? So your knight, after b4, you can run to b7. But after your knight is on b7, does it, does it, doesn't does it it feel like a bit uncomfortable to have your knight on b7 and not your bishop? I feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable with it. So yeah, you would. It, it's not really nice to have your knight on b7. Um, so instead of b6, uh, Calvin was right. e5 is a good move. Um, but so e5 is, is good, but also c5 is good. So let's have a look at e5. After e5, white can actually just take it en passant. So just like this. And after we take it, then why could also go, could go several could go a lot of ways but we're also not gonna get too far into this because i have learned my lesson from the night of night of opening where i got too deep into all the variations and it got a bit too complicated so just keep it simple and stupid <laughs> or is that is that how they say it simple stupid something like that so bishop e6 and now you're targeting uh the c4 pawn and um yeah all right um, also, wait, just, just a sec, b4, aha, so what if white plays b4 here, that, this also kind of makes sense, because it doesn't look like e5 is, is helping your knight escape, right, what happens after b4, because your knight is, is trapped, right, how do you, how do you escape with your knight, or what do you do, kiss indeed, keep it simple, stupid, yeah, it was, it was this, yeah, <laughs> indeed, Um, e4, indeed, of course. You don't need to look at your, you know, you don't need to look at running squares for your, your, like escaping squares for your knight. You can simply play e4, and you're attacking a much more valuable piece, and that's the queen. And then after the queen moves, you can take the knight, and you are attacking another piece, which is the whole point. So you'll be you'll be winning material. All right. So b4 is just simply not possible. All right. E5, good move. Um, we can also play C5. So let's have a look at C5. And C5 is basically, well, it's stopping B4. It is stopping B4. And you're also getting some space, I guess, on the queen side, pushing that pawn forward. Um, and now white could... Oh, I ended the variation here. All right. Anyway. Um, I guess I guess I'm gonna show it with show it to you with a game. So I have like four games prepared for you. Um, actually, three that um, that suit well with the variations I've picked. So one variation, uh, one game um, was um, I already showed. You, no, did I already show you a game? No, I haven't. Oh, I haven't. I haven't. I'm actually gonna show you right now then. Yes, I'm going to show you a game right now where you can see how the players played. And it's again the variation knight c6. So you'll see how they played it. All right. So, yeah. Okay. Let's have a look at, at the first game then. So, all right. This game was played between actually a friend of mine, Johann Sebastian Christensen, and Axel Bachmann. So two 2600s, and this game was played in the Bonter Blitz game. So as a Blitz game, it's logical that you blunder in a Blitz game, um, and that's what White did. So Black won this game. Let's have a look how they played it. So here, they started off with C4. Like I said, you don't have to start with D4, or the moving sequence isn't really, really important, uh, as long as you get into the certain in this certain position. This typical setup, um, it's all fine. So c4, f5, 
knight c3, knight f6, d4, d6 instead of g6, d6 is also a move, knight f3, and g6, g3, move the bishop out, Fianchetto, Fianchetto, I never know how to pronounce this word. <laughs> castle, castle, and knight c6. Okay, so we're familiar with this position, right? We just had a look at this with the variation knight to c6. Um, yeah, all right. Um, all right, so knight c6. Now d5. And here we saw that black could go either knight to e5 or knight to a5. Uh, so in the game... Um, black played knight to e5, all right? Knight takes, pawn takes. So here I mentioned that black uh, has a double pawn, which can be uncomfortable sometimes, but um, on the bright side, there are two strong pawns in the center. You have e pawn, uh, e5 uh, e pawn, and an f5 pawn, and that could lead to a kingside attack. All right, let's see what white played here. White went c5 with the idea to um, later on push d6, probably, and also maybe get a queen on b3 and look uh, at the king. Because I, I also mentioned that the a2 ga diagonal can be weak uh, for checks as well. So now we go h6, h6, and queen b3. All right, queen b3. Now the threat, of course, is to play d6 with a check, and black wants to get rid, uh, doesn't want to uh, get checked. So it goes king h7. All right, so that's that's uh, so h6 really um, uh, made made cleared the way for the king uh, to go to h7. So king h7, rook to d1. So white is getting all of the pieces. Um, like uh, focusing on why is getting all the pieces into the center just to push d6 and now black went a6 just in case white goes knight b5 maybe to get even more pressure on uh, on that square all right queen a3 queen a3 also is also um targeting the d6 um square like this and now we go e4 and e4 is blocking the bishop on g2, because the bishop is kind of annoying. Um, and we are freeing our bishop on g7. And that's what we're doing with e4. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Now, bishop to f4. Um, of course, once you played e4, the square on um, f4 becomes free for your opponent. But no worries about that. We can just kick that bishop with knight to h5. And white does not want to lose his good bishop. So um, white went bishop back to e3. All right. And now f4. What is this move? f4. Well, actually, it's not really that good a move because white could have actually just taken that pawn. And after black takes, well, I can just simply take the knight back. And after rook takes, white takes a pawn on e4. And as you can see, the, the, two, the two strong pawns that we've mentioned before are just gone. There are no more pa strong pawns. The f and e pawn are just gone. So white could have just done that. But instead, white went bishop to d4. Uh, probably trying to trade off the bishops. Um, and black went e4. E3. So, of course, we don't take the bishop ourselves. We can just simply uh, push our pawn to e3 and get more pressure on the king's side. Because that's what these, these, these pawns are about, right? You want to get, give some pressure on the king. All right, e3. Now, white took. Black takes on g3. Um, of course, you want to open up this entire king side, so you're not going to take back on e3, you're going to take back on g3. So just so that you get rid of all of these pawns on a king, and a king becomes, well, basically a naked king. So you're just removing all of its clothes, <laughs> let's see. All right, takes on g3, and now why I decided to take the bishop on g7, we take, ah, I, I actually wanted to, <laughs> I actually googled this because I didn't know how to pronounce it. We call this a uh, Tristan Zug. <laughs> It's German, but I, I I kept on I kept on saying it wrong, so I googled it how to pronounce it, and it's like Tristan Zug. All right, anyway, it doesn't matter. So we have a little Tristan Zug here. 
uh, or how you call it in English, um, an in-between move, something like that. So you give a check. You don't have to take away. Uh, you don't have to take back straight away, of course. Um, always look for zwischenzugs <laughs> if there are if there are in the position because that can be very useful. <laughs> That's good. All right, I try my best. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so we take there with a check, and now White is forced to move the king. So most obvious move is to take back the pawn, right? And now we can take back the bishop. All right, so now you can see that all the pawns in front of the king are just gone. There's no H pawn, no G pawn, no F pawn, and the king is, has become very, very vulnerable. So you can see how aggressive this can be, how aggressive the Dutch can be. Um, so now queen to B4, because the queen on A3 is not doing much anymore and also wants to um, um, get, into, into, uh, get, get into game again. So... With queen before you might get the queen back into the game and now e5 and e5 is basically freeing the queen on the eight and now rook to f1 bishop f5 and now white made a blunder e4 why is this move a blunder does anyone see why oh wow 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 <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Why is this bad? Why is this a bad move? Why? What can Black do now? <clears throat> Cuts Queen and Knight off from the defense. Indeed, Dutch A. Very good. And also Calvin has got it correctly. Ryak, Ryaki also. Yes, queen h4 now. Yeah, white totally forgot about this little check, I think. But of course, it was a blitz game. Maybe white was in time trouble and just thought e4 makes a lot of sense just to kick this bishop. But forgot that the queen will be cut off and can't take the queen on h4 as the pawn is blocking its way, which is very annoying. And now white is just simply lost. Queen h4, once the queen's on h4, the king just needs, can't really hide anymore. The king can only hide, uh, hide behind its bishop. So king g1. And now we go bishop h3. All right. And what is black's threat now? Uh, the threat is not just exchanging uh, the bishop and giving some checks with the queen. There is a much bigger threat here for black. So let's say white makes a random move. Let's say white makes a move a3. Something random. What what can black do now? What is a, what is a, what is a very big threat here? Very good. Yes, very good. Queen g3, of course. And queen g3 is basically threatening mate in one. Of course, white can still play rook f2, but then you're losing your rook and it's going to be mate eventually. So that doesn't work. All right. So white will have to take um, this bishop just in order to not get mated. And black takes. And now d6. Well, now d6 is a, bit, a little bit too late. So white should, have, should probably have pushed it way earlier. Because uh, now the king is just is just gonna get made it very soon, I feel like. And um, now queen g4 check, king h2, rook f4, getting the rook into the game. The rook takes, we take back with a check, the king moves. But luckily we still have another rook and rook f8 will just be game over. Uh, white resigned here, black won, and it is gg. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, the king had, just has nowhere else to hide. It's just a naked king. It'll be made in a few, few moves. So, see, that was a very aggressive game played by Johann Sebastian. All right. So that was the first uh, variation. Now let's have a look at the second variation. So let's go over the moves again. So d4, f5, c4. Knight f6, knight f3, g6, 
g3, bishop, bishop, castle, castle, and d6. All right, so, oh, knight c3. And here we, previous variation, we looked at knight c6, right? Um, but then I said there are also two other variations you could play here. There's c6 and also queen e8. Now we're going to have a look at c6. So what happens if black plays c6? You like it? That is good to hear. I like it too. <laughs> okay, so c6. Now d5. Well, I can still play d5. Uh, and the idea behind d5 is, well, now black goes e5. The idea behind it is to take en passant again. And after the bishop takes, this pawn on, his, on c6 is no longer on c7, uh, as it was with the knight on c6. But now this pawn on d6 can be a target for white. Um, and white can, for example, target this pawn by playing queen d3 or, and then rook d1, and then, for example, bishop f4, just to put pressure, a lot of pressure on his d6 pawn. So that is, that is a plan for white. And now, well, first of all, white needs to defend this c4 pawn first, right? Because it's under attack and the bishop is, is attacking this pawn and it needs to be defended. So white could go either queen d3 here or b3. Now let's have a look at queen d3 first. Just for a second, it's not too long, this variation, just queen d3. Uh, and now a typical move here is knight to a6. You don't go knight to d7, of course. This pawn will be hanging, right? Um, knight to a6, uh, rerouting your knight. And knight to g5, attacking the bishop on e6. So what do we do about this? We go queen e7. Uh, and after bishop e4, which is target, targeting the, the, the d6 pawn, of course, we need to defend it with rook a d8. And it should be about equal. And there are still a lot of possibilities here in this position. But we're not going get, to get, gonna get into this variation too much. We're going to go to b3 instead. Um... Yeah, <laughs> sucks that it's 1 a.m. for you. Uh, but you can always you can always watch back the video. So that's that's one good thing. So all right. So b3, which is also a logical move because you're you're defending the pawn, but you're also preparing your bishop to fianchetto to b2. And now we go knight a6 again. Bishop to b2 and queen e7. Uh, you're, you're, you're getting your queen out of the way just for the rook to move to d8 to, to protect the pawn on d6 a bit. And now after knight g5. Um, yeah, well now you could, with black, you could go either rook a d8 or bishop d7. And um, I'm not going to go further into this, but again, I'm going to show you a game which is um, much more instructive, I feel like to learn from uh, top players. So this game was played between Gelfand Boris, or Boris Gelfand, and Gata Kamski. So let's get into this. All right, two very strong players playing as each other, d4, f5. So here we have it. I'm gonna go a bit, uh, get a bit faster here. C4, castle, and knight c3. All right, so this is the this is the typical setup we have over here. And instead of knight to six, we go c6 here. All right, now d5. And um, here, black goes e5. White takes en passant. We take it back and b3. So the other move was queen e3, but here in this game, they played b3. Knight to six is the move we just saw. This should be two. Queen e7, also uh, good moves, bishop, and now bishop d7. So here I ended the variation, right? Bishop d7, and now let's have a look how both players handled this um, this this game, this uh, position. All right, bishop d7, because black probably wants to keep the bishop pair, and um, now queen d2, black goes h6. Just to kick the knight, the knight is very annoying there. Uh, go back to your spot there where you belong. And now, funny move, bishop back to e6. So the bishop is happy on e6 and wants to stay there um, and doesn't want to be um, driven away again. But of course, if white goes if white goes knight of four, still attacking the bishop and the pawn, well, there's, there's bishop f7. So no worries about that. You don't need to go back to d7. You have a nice little square on f7 for your bishop. 
and you're protecting your pawn on C, uh, on g6. So that is that. But instead of that move, um, white went rook a to d1. So now white is attacking this d6 pawn and it needs to be protected. So what do we do? Rook a d8. And now white went bishop to a3, again targeting the d6 pawn. Really annoying, um, really putting all of the pressure on d6. And now black is blocking that diagonal with knight to c5 and f4. Queen to c7, knight to f2, knight on h3. What uh, The knight on h3 wasn't doing much anyway, so the knight needs to find a better square. Rerouting knight is always a good idea. Rook to e8. The king moves to h8 because, well, as you can see, the white pawn has also moved to f4. Uh, and that means that the diagonal on g1 um, to a7 uh, can be weak for potential checks. So there might be queen b6, which happens in a game. Queen b6 was played. Um, and now queen to c2. And now d5. All right. Now this is getting interesting. From, from here on, it's getting interesting. And it's getting very tactical, actually. So... Um, Mm. Can I show b3, knight, e4? I don't think I have this prepared. I have actually just picked a few variations. So I didn't want to get into too much details. I just wanted to show you the main lines. Um, so, But of course, if you're interested in this opening, you can always uh, look it up yourself. Or you can find tons of games online uh, of how people played it. So, yeah. All right, d5. Okay. So now white takes, it looks like black is actually blundering a pawn, right? Because if white takes and we take back and white takes it, and now white is, well, the big threat is to take the queen, but uh, white is also threatening to take the knight on c5 because the queen and the bishop are both targeting that knight. So well, black will have to do something about that. So knight takes d5 and bishop takes c5. Um, all right. And now queen to c7. And as you can, you can count, right? So um, black has five pawns and white has six pawns. So black has, uh, is down a pawn. But there is something interesting here. Um, white actually blundered now. White played rook to d2, which is not really a good move. Pawn a knight on e3. Well, what would you play here with, with black now in this position? What would you play with black now? Um, a better move for, for white would have been rook to d3 and not rook to d2. And you'll see. Because, um, yeah, now there's some tactical stuff in this position. What would you play here with, with black? It's not really an easy move to see, though. It's not really an easy move. But maybe for those who are... Um, for the legends out there, strong chess players, maybe someone sees it. Maybe someone sees it. Um, yeah, very good Dutch day. That's, yeah, indeed, that's very good. You've mentioned the correct move. Knight e3? <laughs> I, I already had a feeling that people would say this. But knight e3, it seems like... Yeah, it seems very logical, right? Because you're, you're, you're putting your knight on e3. You're giving a double attack on a queen and a rook. But... But white can take there. And you're not even winning a queen. Because the queen is protected by the rook. And you've basically just blundered a piece. So... Yeah, you need to be careful here. So not knight to e3, because the queen is protected by the rook. Um, so black actually played bishop to c3. Bishop to c3. Very interesting move. You're attacking the bishop, uh, the bishop, the rook on d2 here. But you're also cutting off the queen from the bishop. So now you're also attacking the bishop here on c5. So bishop c3, very interesting move. And now, 
it looks like white can take on d5, right? Rook takes d5. It looks interesting because um, you're removing a defender and then you can also take the bishop on c3, right? But black um, black actually has only one move that is that is that is good. The other move is bad. So the good move to play here is rook takes d5 and not bishop takes z5. Because it, it seems more logical to take with your bishop, right? But if you take with your bishop, right, white takes the bishop on c3. Okay. Now you take the bishop on g2, for example, the king takes and b6. And you can see that it's, it's about equal, right? You can count the material. Black has two rooks against a rook, a knight and a bishop, and also a pawn, right? So it's about equal here. But keep in mind, if you take back with the rook instead, and not with the bishop, if white now takes on c3, you can take the bishop on c5. So that's one good thing about the rook, about rook takes d5. You have rook takes c5 here. And now, yeah, well, black is just winning. Um, and also, um, so queen takes c3 is not good. So the good move, the better move, the best move here would be bishop b4, but it's still very bad for white. What move can we play with black? Because white is now threatening to take the bishop on c3, right? And if the bishop moves somewhere, the queen will be captured. So you need to be, you need to be careful what move you play here. What move does black play here? How do we not lose the bishop? Yes, indeed. Bishop e5. Very good. Um, mm, mm, mm. Yes, bishop bishop e5. Um, make the white rook c8. What? The white rook c8? Oh, you mean rook c8? Just just rook c8? Uh, rook c8, you're... Yeah, well, you're protecting the bishop, right? But the queen will just capture it, right? And after we take it, uh, bishop takes back. And after we take back the the bishop, the bishop will probably take here. Now we take back, and you can count the material; it's equal again. <laughs> so it's not it's not really winning here. But we have a much better move, and you guys have mentioned it. It's bishop e5. Bishop e5, and you're just protecting your queen on c7. So after white takes, we take it back. If white takes on d5, we take with a check. And after the king, after, for example, the king moves, we win this pawn on e2 as well. And it's just it's just much, much better for, for black. So the, the rook enters the second rank, and it's just very, very strong. So that's what happens. All right, very tactical, right? Very, very tactical. So after bishop c3, white decided not to play rook takes d5. Even though the engine says it's the best move here, but in the game, uh, Boris decided to go knight d3 and just give up on the exchange. Um, decided that this might be the best move for um, himself. And also knight d3 is uh, protecting the bishop on c5, so knight d3 instead. And um, Kamsky is not greedy. He went b6 first to hit on the bishop, and after the bishop moves, well, then he decided to take the rook on d2. Um, now queen takes, and we go queen c3. Of course, when you're up material, you you want to exchange pieces, right? Um, and get a game and get it over uh, as fast as you can. So queen c3, um, and Boris went queen c1 because after queen takes, there's a rook on c1. We have an active we have an active rook. Well, after rook c8, you basically just lose uh, the the c file because white doesn't want to exchange. Another another piece um, and decides to go to the corner and basically just cry there. The bishop, the rook is just crying in the a1 corner <laughs> and hiding. All right, knight to c3, attacking the e2 pawn. 
and now white went bishop f3, which wasn't actually necessary. Bishop f3 was actually a bad move because now black has a, another tactic here. What tactic did Kamsky have here? Bishop f3 is useless, actually. What did black play? Another tactic. This game is full of tactics. So if you're a tactical player, go for Dutch. Go for it. <laughs> but you should, you should also know what you're what you're doing, though. <laughs> so um, definitely definitely study um, the opening carefully and and um, look at uh, all kinds of variations. Very good. Knight takes e2. It's just possible. Black can just simply take this pawn because. White, if white takes the knight back, we have bishop d5 check. And you are basically winning this bishop back. So after king moves, we take the bishop. And we've won our pawn back. And black is just much, much better. Black is also uh, ha also has a seventh rank now. And it's just totally winning. So bishop f3 was just basically useless. And black took it. So white was like, oh no, why did I miss this? All right, let's go rook e1. Make some more moves before I resign. Knight c3, knight b4, and knight e4. And here, here uh, Boris resigned. He didn't want to play on anymore. Um, great tactics, right? Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, are you guys more tactical play players or uh, positional players? I'm curious. All right. Now, that was the game. Very tactical. And now let's get into the last variation, which is queen e8, which is most popular now. All right. All right. D4, f5, c4. Try to memorize the, the moves already. We've, we've seen it several times now, so it should be easier. c4, knight f6, knight f3, g6, g3, bishop g7, bishop g2, castle and castle. And now d6. And knight c3. All right, here we have the typical setup again. And now instead of knight c6, instead of c6, we go queen to e8. You're more a positional player, personally. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, for me, for yeah, I I like tact. I like more exciting games, like tactical games. But it's easy to miss things, and you need to calculate a lot. So it depends. It really depends. All right, so knight c3, uh, and now we go queen e8. All right, queen to e8. What is it? What what is the idea behind queen e8? Well, the queen is basically the, the queen has the idea to go to f7. That's where you want to place a queen, and you're basically covering your king from potential checks. But you're also getting your queen onto the king side, which we mentioned to have a potential king side attack. So that's where the queen. Um, that's where you can place your queen on f7. So you get your queen closer to the king side and maybe push some more pawns and then mate white. Easy as that. <laughs> All right, queen e8. Now, white could go several ways again. White could go d5. Um, white could go b3. White could also go rook to e1. Now let's see what happens after b3. <clears throat> after b3, we can play e5. Our queen is luckily supporting this pawn here, so we can push the pawn here. And after white takes, we take it back. And we have some two strong pawns again on f5 and e5. Luckily, they're not doubled, as, as we saw earlier. And now e4, e, e4. So you're not allowing black to take up the entire center White is also giving some resistance with e4. And now knight c6, developing the knight. And knight d5. Of course, white has a nice, nice square uh, on d5. Why not put the knight there? And the white cannot really be kicked away immediately. There's no immediate c6 or whatever, because the knight is blocking this pawn. Uh, and now um, queen e7, defending this c, c7 pawn, of course. Um, I know you're attacking this e4 pawn twice and you can just win this pawn easily. Um, but this c7 threat is just a much bigger threat. So you need to take care of that pawn first. You need to protect it. 
and um, queen e7 is the best move here. If you go queen f7, you would just be losing a tempo, and it's just not really good because now white has knight g5, and you will have to move your queen again. Uh, now, you, of course, you can go queen d7, but why not move your queen to d7 immediately when you can, right? And now white has some has two very strong knights on g5 and d5, so it's better to put your queen on d7 immediately. Is queen d8 better? You mean here? Queen d8? Queen d8, um, I guess it's also possible. I guess it's also a possible move, yeah. Um, but it, it came from d8. <laughs> so d7, also d7, mm, you're... Mm, well, I guess d8 is playable though, but in the variation and in the theory, they say queen d7. So don't ask me, I didn't invent the theory. I didn't. All right. Anyway, here the variation stops. And um, yeah. All right. So instead of b3, we could also go rook to e1 in this position. Um, with the idea to push e4, of course. And the queen goes to f7 now, attacking the c4 pawn. Now white goes e4, pushing the e4 pawn up towards the center. Now we take it. And um, white takes it back and we go knight c6. After d5, um, we take the knight there. After rook takes, we move our knight to e5. And then the variation still continues, but I'm going to end it here because we're going to look at a, um, a more common variation, which is d5. So here, um, yeah, I'm just going to end it here. So just know that b3 and rook e1 are also possible moves for white to play. But we're going to have a look at d5 first, because um, d5 is more, more played. Um, it's a difficult opening. <laughs> yeah, you should definitely know what you're what you're doing. Um, so you should definitely study some theory here. But overall, I don't think it's that hard. Definitely, the first few moves, um, the, the moving sequence is is just almost always the same, and then you have several ways to go. Um, so knight c6, c6, and queen e8. So let's have a look at d5 now. So d5 again uh, after. Um, well, you're, again, you're looking at the e6 square just in case to take en passant, but you're also getting some space in the center. And now knight to a6. You just came here. What, what is the opening? Uh, it's actually in the title. Uh, it's called the Leningrad Dutch. So are you familiar with that? Mm, yeah, we've already looked at two variations. Uh, and now we're looking at the last one. And then I'm, and then I'm also going to show uh, a game to finish it off with. So, yeah. But of course, if you're late or you missed the stream, you can always look back. So, don't worry about it. Knight to a6. All right. So, you, you can see that black almost always goes knight to a6, right? So, such moves, if you don't know the theory, you wouldn't, you wouldn't naturally place your knight on a6. So... Definitely, when you're studying the Dutch, you should definitely look at such moves and um, how grandmasters, for example, play it. All right, rook b1. Rook b1 trying to push uh, b4. Bishop to d7. Now white goes b4. And c6. <laughs> you just know that f5 is Dutch, but you're really bad at openings. Um. <laughs> but okay. I don't think openings are that important, though, um, especially as if you're a beginner. So don't worry too much about it. D takes C6, B takes C6 now, and A3. Okay. And now Knight to C7, for example. Bishop to B2. And now Black could go several ways. For example, um, Knight to E6 is possible. Um, this is played, uh, what is also possible, uh, rook to b8 is possible, and also a5 is possible here. So different ways to go for black. Um, so yeah, this is how it could go. And I'm going to show you a game 
the last game that I'm going to show you. Maybe I also have a game of Alexander Kustinuk that I want to show, but I'm, I'm going to see if I can make it in time. If not, then, um, then I'll just uh, leave it. All right, let's look at the last game, which is played actually by a Dutch guy. It's played by a Dutch guy called Roland Preussers against Kasper Pjoren. So Roland is black and Kasper is um, white or Kotsper with a C. I don't know how to pronounce it. Probably Polish. <laughs> All right. Anyway. So let's see what happened here. Okay, here, surprisingly, we started off with knight f3 and not c4 or d4. Knight f3, also possible, of course. f5, d4, knight f6, g3, g6, bishop, bishop, castle and castle. All right. So here we are familiar with it by now. And, and now queen to e8. All right. Queen to a8, and now rook to e1. Idea is to push um, e4. Queen to f7, attacking the f uh, the c4 pawn, but also getting your queen onto the king side, which is a good idea. And now e4, black takes it, white takes it, knight to c6. All right, here, yeah, here black went to c6 instead of a6, um, and after knight g5, black can just simply take the pawn on c4. But after bishop f1, we retreat the queen. b3. Uh, uh, all right, good night. <laughs> it's, well, you guys are watching that late. 1.22 a.m. Oh, my. <laughs> Go to sleep. Go to sleep. You can rewatch it in the morning. <gasps> Do I play Dutch regularly myself in, in my own games? I've never played the Dutch. I have never. I've only played E5 and C5. I only played these two openings. But the Dutch I've never considered playing. I don't know. Maybe they should invent the opening, the Belgian. Maybe that'd be nice. That'd be cool, right? The Belgian. Oh, I would definitely play it. <laughs> Why is there no such opening? Um, <clears throat> um, all right. So, b3. Developing the bishop. So, queen f5, uh, a5 now. Um, uh, how about d5 instead of queen f7? You mean, oh... Instead of all of that, okay. Uh, let's see, rook e1. d5. Uh, oh, you mean here, wait, just a second. So here, d5 you want to play? d5 doesn't really look like a good move to me, to be honest. Um, yeah, because... <laughs> well, first of all, d5, you are kind of blundering upon. And second of all, this square on e5 becomes available for the knight. So, yeah, d5 is not really a move to consider play, playing. But anyway, queen takes e4, where were we? We were on queen uh, a5 and now bishop d2. So the queen is uh, a little bit um, wandering around. Um, and now queen b6. Bishop f4. E5. What would it be, the Belgian? I don't know. You tell me. What what would the Belgian be, guys? I don't know. <laughs> it would be a pretty, I don't know, Belgian opening. <laughs> uh, maybe in the shape of a of, of a waffle or something. Don't tell me. I don't know. I have no clue. All right. D takes E5 and now Knight to G4. And Knight to G4 is now targeting the F2 pawn. Um, all right, and also the rook can be can come um, free. And now white takes on d6, and instead of taking back, we can of course take on f2. Um, it's not really th that dangerous because after the king moves, there's not really a direct mating pattern or whatever. Because white is really defending well. White has a knight on f3. Uh, the knight is really well protected, um, <clears throat> and the pawn in d6 is actually kind of scary if black doesn't pay any attention to it. So now knight to d4. Um, all right. And now bishop to c4 check, which isn't really a good move by white. White should have played um, rook to e7 instead. 
um, which is actually activating the rook, but also targeting the, the, the c7 pawn. So your rook on, a, on the seventh rank can definitely cause some trouble for black. Uh, as a queen on f2 and a knight on g4, they look like they're they're like they're cooperating together, but it's not really it. I mean, there's not really a, a specific mating pattern here that black can go for, and actually white is better here. So rook e7 would have would have been a good move, but instead white went bishop c4 check. All right, a check is always tempting, right? A check is very very tempting, but now we move the king. After h3, black is actually winning now. Why is h3 such a blunder by white? What can black do now? Why is h3 so bad? Can you guys see why h3 is bad? <clears throat> oh, oh, really, Dutch Day? I didn't know that. Oh, interesting. The beanie line. Never heard of that. <laughs> Looks like you know a lot of openings. Uh, okay, let's see. Knight takes f3. Very good, Martin. Knight takes f3. So after we take that, um, white, of course, cannot take the knight on g4 because, well, there is just mate in one on h2. So that is just not possible. Um, so black, um, uh, white will have to take it back like this. Uh, and now what is the only move for black that wins here? What does black do now? What do we do now? Also very tactical here, very aggressive. I thought it wouldn't work a second later. <laughs> That's why you delete the message. No, it's actually a very good move. Very good. What do, what does black do now? Um, rook, rook takes f4. Mm. No. No. Not rook takes f4. Not rook takes f4. Hmm. Okay. There is a much strong... It's actually the only move that is winning for black. It's the only move that's winning for black. And also keep in mind that white is, white is hitting on this knight on g4, right? So... It's very, very tactical. I don't think it's... Is it an easy... No, it's not really an easy move. I thought it would, would have been pretty... A logical sequence after knight takes f3, but maybe it's not that obvious. All right. Okay, let's see what happens after rook takes f4. Because I've seen some people typing this rook takes f4, um, going for a, an exchange sack, I guess. But um, just intuition. <laughs> You shouldn't, intuition is good, but you shouldn't always go for intuition. You should also calculate sometimes. <laughs> uh, oh, g5, that's actually the correct move. Very good, Ryaki. G5 is the correct move. Um, so, all right, anyway, uh, after rook takes, I guess, um, well, your your knight is just, j just attacked. Well, can y just, can y just take it like that? And then I don't know where does where does this knight goes. What do you want? Knight to e three or but you can always defend. Like I don't I don't really see I don't really see how you can like how you can mate or or whatever. But okay. Anyway, g five is a move. G five is a move because now if if bishop to d two, let's say for example, because you're 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 kicking a bishop. If the bishop moves. And bishop d2 is actually the only logical move to put your bishop, um, or even you even take whatever. If you take, then let's say um, we can take on. Wait, you know what? Let's go bishop d2. It makes it makes more sense maybe. And then we can take on g3. And now after let's say uh, pawn takes, 
we can take there on g4. And we're, we're looking at the knight here. And we're threatening to take it. And the king is a little bit a little bit much vul very, very vulnerable, I would say. So that can't end well for white. Um, so... Yes, the knight cannot capture because of me. The knight is just stuck here. The knight can't move anywhere because there's this continuous mate, mate, mating threat on h2. So g5 is actually a very, very strong move because black knows that white cannot take it with knight, but also not with the bishop. The g3 pawn is hanging. So instead of moving the bishop, white went to bishop to, uh, rook to f1. Rook to f1. <clears throat> All right, now we take the bishop on f4, and um, h takes g4 was played. Uh, of course, you're you're. It looks like you're giving up on your queen, but after if white takes the queen, it's not really good because after you take with check, you're just winning. You're just up material. Um, so after black, uh, after white takes it, you can count the material. Black has a rook. Is a rook up? Um, and also this pawn doesn't have that much of a future on d6. It, it, it can't really promote, I would say. Uh, you can even take it, so... Yeah, it's not that scary anymore. Alright, so not rook takes f2, h takes g4. And now we take the pawn on g3. The, the threat, the, the pressure with the queen on a king is still there. Uh, also the g pawn is still hanging, there's still this threat there. And after knight's h2. Black went f3, threatening checkmate on g2. Um, so white went rook g1, protecting that checkmate. Queen h4. <clears throat> Queen to d5. Bishop to d7. Probably with the idea to go bishop c6. And then maybe f2, which would be actually a very nice, very, very nice move. Um, and here, oh, here white resigned. All right, I thought the move, I thought the game went on a little bit more, but here it ended. And white actually resigned here. So, yeah. So let's say white goes, what's the best move here? Rook a, f1. And I guess you can just play rook, uh, bishop c6, right? Bishop c6 and then the queen moves and it just yeah, it can't look good. It can be good. It just can be good. All right. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty hard to see though. I agree. So, yeah, all right. That was also I I showed you like three tactical games. Oh my. So, if you love tactics, if you love such <laughs> such aggressive openings, then go ahead, play it. I'm not sure if I'll ever play it because I feel like I'm gonna miss miss a thousand things here. Definitely, but um, yeah, definitely. Maybe a, maybe in Blitz, I, I could try it out though. I could try it out. All right, that was it. That was it. Um, yeah, I might not show the Alexander Cost new game because I feel like it's gonna take too long. Um, yeah, but okay. Anyway. I showed you the three uh, games I wanted to show you and the three variations I wanted to show you. And I hope you learned a bit more about the Leningrad Dutch. So yeah, that was it. All right. I had a lot of fun teaching it. And also, I also learned something from it. That's, al that's always good, right? Fabulous games, amazing. Oh, <laughs> amazing. Okay. Uh, thanks, Calvin. All right. See you later, guys. I uh, I don't know when the next coaches stream will be. I, I'm not sure if this Julius Bar thingy will continue for much longer. I think it'll end soon, though. But um, I'll be back soon, though. I'll be back very, very soon. Probably with something else. But okay. Um, all right. See you later, guys. See you later. And thanks for... Uh,